So I'm going to talk about the reasons why we need to do something different than insulin, why we need to preserve beta cells in particular. I'm also going to say a little bit about immunotherapy. And then I think Parth is going to talk about how we would screen to detect early uh, type 1 diabetes. And Rachel is going to talk about the impact that this can have in the way we diagnose our patients with type 1 diabetes. So we can just move on from here. Oh, they moved on. So here are my disclosures. So let's start with glycemic control. And we've heard a lot of excitement in this meeting so far about type 1 diabetes and the things that are changing. But we need to just take a check on reality. And this is data from the National Diabetes Audit showing the percentage of individuals with an HbA1c less than 58 or 7.5%. I would point out that really, I think the target should be 7% here. But what this is trying to illustrate is there's red along the top is type 2 diabetes, blue along the bottom is type 1 diabetes. And it's showing that whereas two thirds of people with type 2 diabetes reach target, despite all the innovations of the last 100 years, uh, only about one third or less than a third of people with type 1 diabetes reach this slightly higher target. And I've updated this slide as much as I can uh, with the latest data from the National Diabetes Audit. I'm not sure if the very last points on 2021 uh, are, are really comparable to the earlier points, but essentially what it's showing you is that actually very little progress has been made uh, in the last few years, possibly in the last year, which is interesting, and possibly a change in type 2 diabetes in the last year, but essentially these curves are flat. So in, in children, by contrast, a lot of difference is made. What I'm showing you there was data on adults. I should just emphasize that. In children, progress has been made. Um, so somebody else needs to go on to mute if they can. Um, a lot of progress has been made. And you can see here going from 2010 up to 2019, 20, this is the National Pediatric Diabetes Audit. It's gone from only 15 or 16% reaching that target to now 36%, which is better than the adults. But that said, we're still only one third of children reaching the target, which prevents them from long term complications, which is a long way from where we want to be. Now, intriguingly, and this is uh, just shown recently from the NPDA, you see this is um, HbA1c by year of diagnosis. So what you're seeing is here um, on the left hand side, you'll see less than one year, then, then one year after diagnosis, two years, three years, four years, five, and then five to 10 years. And then you're seeing it in different age groups. Um, so in the light blue, that's five to nine, and then in the next one up 10 to 14, and the next one is 15 to 19. And I think this is a fascinating slide because it shows you that they all start together pretty much in the first year, but then they begin to separate by age group. So the teenagers along the top end up heading for 70, and the uh, little children along the bottom age, five to nine, manage to uh, continue to uh, operate around 60. Now, why is it that the HbA1c deteriorates and why do they end up in different trajectories at the end of the day? Well, I think I would argue that the reason that things change and many people feel there's that sort of honeymoon phase, if you like, in the first year is the loss of beta cell function after diagnosis. And this slightly older slide is showing each one of these dots is a person and their C peptide level, which is a measure of their beta cell function. And uh, we're showing you the green line below the green line is believed to be uh, essentially not clinically significant uh, beta cell function. And the dots are trying to show you above is adults, below is adolescents, and suggesting that by five years out, 97% of adolescents and 92% uh, of adults are below the green line. So as the, the, as the HbA1c, uh, sorry, as the C peptide declines, the HbA1c seems to rise. And that fits with data such as this, uh, which is cross-sectional data, but showing you C-peptide on the left and HbA1c in the second column here. So that point two is where the green line was on the previous uh, graph. And it's suggesting that uh, individuals with more than that level of C-peptide or beta cell preservation have an HbA1c here that's one percentage point lower than it is for those with no detectable C-peptide at all. Or that 51% reach that target close to 18% uh, when they don't have C-peptide. And notice on the right-hand side, it's not because they're taking more insulin, they're actually taking less insulin. So this is beginning to illustrate the benefits of C-peptide preservation. And the second effect, which I think was illustrated in the NPDA slide, is where the, the, the individuals end up. So here you can see what I think is being called now in the NDA, the bulge, which is the peak 
um, between the ages of about 15 and 20 to 25. And this is American data showing that peak happening here, and then it settles down the mean age BA1C at, at, at different age groups. This is cross-sectional data. So we could argue from this that preserving as much endogenous beta cell function as possible for as long as possible should have the potential to improve outcomes, should have the potential to improve people's ability to control their blood sugars. And I'm going to argue now, especially for those least engaged with their therapy, because the challenge for the, the, the teenagers is probably not that they have a different, um, different disease, but that they're less engaged with their therapy. And that's the reason that they end up with an asymptote that's higher, or they become the bulge that's higher, uh, their, their HbA1c uh, goes higher. But they started at the same place. So I like to say, as Tesco says, every little helps, but also that um, uh, beta cell preservation reaches the parts that other beers can't reach. In other words, for people who find compliance is challenging, such as we see with the teenagers. And we can take this a step further, because uh, as, as, as we'll hear, by the time you present with type 1 diabetes, you've lost about 80% of your beta cell function. And in fact, the red line on one of the previous slides was actually at the 5% level of beta cell function. So if we can slow the autoimmune process, we can actually get to the point where we don't need um, insulin at all. So we can delay or avoid the need for insulin, and then everybody can manage that because they don't need to take insulin. I'll come back to this point in a moment. A couple of other points, um, which is that unfortunately, uh, the life expectancy for type 1 diabetes, especially diagnosed in childhood, is having an impact. Now, we don't know whether the improvements are going to uh, play through, but they're taking quite a while to get through. But what it's showing you here is that um, uh, if you're diagnosed um, under the age of 10, a recent analysis from Sweden suggests that you've got a 16 year reduction in your life expectancy. And then uh, if you're diagnosed and over the age of 10, it's still a 10 year reduction in life expectancy. And a lot of this has got a lot of socioeconomic uh, elements that correlate with it and correlate with glycemic control. So I, I've called this 2019 or modern era, surely with pump therapy and now closed loop pump therapy, um, we can get around all of this. Well, um, a lot of the people in that data that I showed you earlier on in the T1D exchange were actually using technology, perhaps not the latest closed loop pump technology. Um, but I thought this data was very interesting, recently published from the Scottish group, showing the impact of technology on HbA1c. And what they were looking at is the mean HbA1c prior to starting on pumps, and then the mean HbA1c to the right after starting on pumps. Now, it's very important to realize that not everybody gets offered a pump, and it tends to be offered, unfortunately, to those who are doing well in the first place, and it's important to bear that in mind. But what was interesting to me here is that on the right-hand side, and I'm sorry if it's not very uh, clear to see, but you can see they've broken down that change, that improvement of 0 0.5 millimoles per mole after, after the, the, the line in the middle when they converted onto a pump, by age group. And you can possibly just see that there's a red line, some red dots there, which are the 13 to 18 year olds. So they didn't show an improvement overall in introduction of, of pump therapy, whereas many of the other, in fact, the underage, the lower age groups did. So technology, there are some people where the technology is not easily able to reach them and cause the improvements that we want to see. And I just want to emphasize this with one more um, piece of data, which was led by Rob French in our group, and looking at the educational outcomes in Welsh children with type 1 diabetes. And you'll see the relevance of this in just a moment. So what he did was to link the health data with the educational data, which is an enormous challenge to do, actually, but he managed to achieve it. And so he's able to look at the educational outcomes, meaning uh, GCSE results, so results at age 16, in 263,000 children in Wales uh, without type 1 diabetes and 1,200 with diabetes, which is covering almost the whole population. And uh, the results were really quite remarkable. If I can go back one step here. So here you can see here on, on this graph, in the middle of the, the screen, there's a dotted line. And that dotted line shows the comparison of the children with diabetes to the people without diabetes. And what it's showing with the dot on the left hand side, that overall, there was no difference at all in the GCSE results between the 1200 children with type 1 diabetes and the 260,000 children 
without type 1 diabetes, which is quite remarkable considering what they have to deal with. However, and it's a big however, there was a huge difference by HbA1c status. So once you broke it down into quintiles of HbA1c, the first dot that's way above the dotted line is the best quintile of HbA1c or the lowest quintile of HbA1c. And the furthest one to the right is the uh, highest, let's call it HbA1c, the worst if you want to look at it that way. And there's a huge difference in achievement across that spectrum. And you can look at it uh, by grades, if you like, that, um, uh, that the, the best quintile would get eight C grades, whereas the lowest quintile would get seven D and an E grade equivalent. So a very big difference. And what was intriguing is that there was no difference by the age of diagnosis. So this suggests it's not the duration or the exposure to diabetes that's doing this. It's something else. It's not the diabetes itself. So longer exposure has, has, no, has no effect. And we replicated, or Rob replicated this effect when he looked at, at the progression to university. And roughly you can see here, it's broken down exactly the same way as the previous slide, uh, which is that compared to the, um, the children without diabetes, there was no difference in the ones that, in the percentage that went to university, but in the best HbA1c group, 30% went to university, and in the, the highest or worst HbA1c group, only 10%. So what this really reflects, we believe, is that the same factors that impact on self-care impact on education, and that these same factors around compliance will be a challenge for both issues, both education as illustrated here, but also for self-care. So self-care with your, your diabetes. So we need to find a way that it can reach people with, um, with less levels of compliance. Okay, so type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and this is uh, slides from Noel Morgan's group in intact islet with a brown straining for, ins straining for insulin, red for glucagon in the islet, and then insulitis shown by the arrows. And then eventually to the right, you can still see red for glucagon, but you don't see brown for insulin. So if it's an autoimmune disease, maybe we should treat the immune system rather than just giving insulin. That's fairly obvious perhaps, but it's not an approach we've taken up until now. And this is showing you some maybe the complexities of the immune system, there are now lots of different points in which we could intervene. And every gray oval there is a different monoclonal antibody picking off different parts of the immune system. So we can now selectively um, intervene in the immune system. So it's important to draw a distinction as, as in this um, table here between generalized immunosuppression, cyclosporin, those kind of drugs that are used for transplantation. That's not what we're talking about here but selective immunosuppression using the more subtle biologics that are now used in almost all other autoimmune diseases. We don't as yet know how to boost directly immune regulation for specific targets such as the beta cells, and hopefully that'll be a generation to come. So we now know of at least six different immune interventions that can preserve beta cells in new onset type, uh, type 1 diabetes, and I'm showing you some of them here, and I'm not going to go into them in detail, but it's to remind you or to emphasize that we do have medications that are effective. But strikingly, none of them are licensed for use in type 1 diabetes, whereas here in psoriasis, another autoimmune disease, uh, eight different therapies are already licensed. And of course, we've got many in rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, et cetera, and inflammatory bowel disease. So to preserve beta cells, we want to detect the disease early, that's screening, and we also want to intervene early because that would allow us to do what we discussed earlier, which is to preserve beta cells to the level where you wouldn't actually need insulin at all. And so that's tried, I've tried to illustrate that here. So up the x-axis, the y-axis here is C-peptide, so the amount of beta cells you have. When you're in the green zone, and we don't know the exact cutoff level here, but when you're in the green zone, you don't need insulin. And so I put on the right, you have no metabolic risk. When you're in the yellow zone, you're perhaps in those first years or so after diagnosis, when you have some D-peptide, you're in low metabolic risk, you have the honeymoon or you don't have so much hypoglycemia, and then you gradually deteriorate into the orange zone, which is high metabolic risk, i.e. risk of hypoglycemia and ketoacidosis, and then maybe some get almost no C-peptide at all or beta cell function in the red zone along the bottom. And the black line is trying to illustrate what we think would happen without intervention, whereas the other lines are intervening 
either in the green zone, so before you get diabetes with that first blue arrow, and then you could intervene again with that yellow arrow, and then you could have with that, that blue dotted line, it now takes you eight or nine years before you get into the high metabolic risk time. So the time when most many people can't get optimal glycemic control. So it would allow you many years of very good glycemic control. So um, many people will be familiar with this, uh, which was the publication just now, uh, nearly just three years ago now, of the first treatment that was used in the pre-diabetes space, um, this drug, teplizumab here, which is an anti-CD3 therapy. And it's given over 12 to 14 days as a, an infusion, and then there's no more therapy that's required after that. And the results, as, as many people are familiar with now, but were quite striking there. And that's showing you in the black line, the deterioration over time. So the number of people who don't have diabetes. So it started off with none of them having diabetes. And so one or hundred percent, and then declined over time. And after five years, some 78% of, um, of the placebo treated individuals who developed type one diabetes had gone into having the glycemic levels of type one diabetes. This is looking at those with two antibodies, so they're at high risk of developing uh, type 1 diabetes. And then the red line was those given that just that 14 day treatment. And after a median follow up of two and a half years, there was a delay of nearly three years in the onset of, of um, stage three or clinical type 1 diabetes. So that single immune event intervention really showed that you could prevent. And a lot of people ask the question, well, is that worth it? Um, and of course, you could do another intervention after that, but I would use the following arguments that during those three years, you have near normal glycemia, certainly not gl blood glucose levels that put you at risk for type 1 uh, for long term microvascular complications. Importantly, from what I've been saying up until this point, during that period, once you've completed the therapy, there were no lifestyle restrictions, you could run around, go to school, you could play games. You didn't have to take insulin at all, so there was no risk of hypoglycemia. And that means that there's very limited compliance required and everybody can achieve it. Also, having three years of very good glycemic control gives you a legacy of reduced long-term complications. And you're less likely to have this adolescent bulge. So if you're diagnosed later, you spend less time in that 15 to 20 year old age group where you have uh, least engagement, if you like and least likely to have poor control. We're gonna hear a little bit more in the subsequent talks about how detecting type one diabetes early can help with the diagnosis and diabetic ketoacidosis at diagnosis. We don't know what costs are gonna look like, but currently with more pump therapy and closed loop therapy starting from diagnosis, it may be similar to the costs of intensive insulin management. And of course, if you have preserved your beta cells, you can do it again, as I was showing you in that diagram with the different arrows. If you have beta cell function, you could do something else, not just that 14 day therapy. We've got those six other therapies and there are many more being feeding through that could be used to continue to preserve beta cell function. So this is a screenshot I took from Food and Drug, uh, Food and Drug Agency's advisory panel uh, in the state. All that, and it's showing when an, uh, in an open discussion, there was a, a vote as to whether it was considered acceptable to have an immune intervention such as this in pre-diabetes. And you probably can't see it, but it, the vote went 10 to, set, 10 to 7 in favor of saying that this was, uh, that the benefits outweighed the risks. And that drug now is going through the process with the FDA, and maybe we'll hear the results uh, in mid-August. And potentially, uh, if it was approved, we might get similar approvals in the UK in 2023. Um, currently, long-term safety for that particular drug looks pretty good. Follow-up for seven years or four years with a related drug has shown no long-term uh, infection or malignancy risks. And in fact, the T cells recover within about six to eight weeks. So you don't have long-term immunosuppression associated with this therapy. And so we're beginning to think about things that might work like this. You'll hear more in the future talks about screening or early detection of type 1 diabetes by detecting the autoantibodies. And what this is looking at is three phases, maybe. At the moment, we don't have a licensed immunotherapy, so we might screen for type 1 diabetes uh, to in include people in into clinical trials of new therapies, such as we saw with the teplizumab. If this drug or another drug is then licensed in the middle, then we're actually going to start looking, perhaps particularly in families, to test people for early type 1 diabetes and to intervene. 
where we hope to go on the right hand side eventually is a national screening program and then we can screen all 700,000 if you like live births and children all the way through to pick up as many as we can. So in conclusion, why preserve beta cells? So less than 30% of children or adults achieve optimal control with insulin, meaning levels of blood glucose that prevent long-term complications. Glycemic control with insulin imposes a significant burden on patients, and I would say to healthcare practitioners, because we spent such a long amount of time adjusting insulin and training people on insulin and so on. If we didn't have to do that, we could save a lot of time doing the prevention activities, for example. Preservation of beta cells improves glycemic control without a major compliance burden because many of these therapies don't have to be adjusted uh, according to diet or exercise, for example. And immune intervention in pre-type 1 diabetes can provide several years of insulin-free normoglycemia with the short and long-term benefits associated with that. Thank you.